my name's Rodney. Um, it's great to be with you. I'm one of the elders here at Redeemer. And um, so we are in a series on two, in 2 Samuel tagged by, called by default or by design. Um, and um, as you already will have picked up, there are some pretty heavy subjects in this section. And uh, today is no exception to that. Um, and so we're looking at 2 Samuel 13, the first 22 verses. And um, it's the rape of David's daughter, Tamar, by her half-brother, Amnon. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? This is not a light, fluffy morning. I don't know if we ever have those. Um, don't answer that one. But I just want to say, I can't see any, but this, the material isn't suitable for children. So, um, but hopefully they're, they're all out. But I just wanted to make you aware of the nature of the talk before I start, rather than suddenly blast in there and it's all, <gasps> oh no, if I'd have known. <laughs> so um, we're going to read the passage in a bit and then we're going to pray. And, you know, if you feel like this isn't for you, then I understand that. So, but it's in the Bible and we're going to preach it. But, but I mean, who wants to preach a passage like this? I mean, <clears throat> you know, I mean, I tried to bat it back to Joel. <laughs> I mean, Joel drew up the series and he gave me the passage. So, uh, but he didn't want to touch it. <laughs> he says, no. In the, he says, in the name of Jesus, I don't receive that. <clears throat> so I had to do it. But that's okay because I feel God has helped me with it and hopefully we can all learn some stuff um, and hear God in the midst of what is a terrible situation. So um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to speak very briefly, uh, put it in the context of the bigger picture, so that we understand this wider thing that's going on through these verses, through these chapters rather, in 2 Samuel. But I want to spend the majority of the time focusing on Tamar's trauma. So most of the time we'll be looking at that. And we're going to finish with hope. We've got to finish with hope, haven't we? Um, we finish with hope for all victims of sexual abuse. And Sue, my wife, is going to come up and help me with that a little later. So let's read the passage. Um, and it is quite a long passage. It should come up on the screen. Um, and um, let me read it to you. There we go. Okay, 2 Samuel 13. In the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. Amnon became so obsessed with his sister Tamar that he made himself ill. She was a virgin, and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. Now, Amnon had an advisor named Jonadab, son of Shemiel, David's brother. Jonadab, dab, bab, dab, dab. <coughs> oh, dear. Jonadab um, was a very, uh, had a very annoying name, was a very uh, shrewd man. Shrewd is a funny word that is being used here for what he's about to do. Uh, he asked Amnon, why do you, the king's son, look so haggard uh, morning after morning? Won't you tell me? Amnon said to him, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Go to bed and pretend to be ill. When your father comes to see you, say to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare the food in my sight so that I may watch her and then eat it from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. When the king came to see him, Amnon said to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and make some special bread in my sight so I may eat it from her hand. David sent word to Tamar at the palace, go to the house of your brother Amnon and prepare some food for him. So Tamar went to the house of her brother Amnon who was lying down. She took some dough, kneaded it, made the bread in his sight and baked it. Then she took the pan and served him the bread, but he refused to eat. Send everyone out of here, Amnon said. So everybody, everyone left him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, bring the food here into my bedroom so that I may eat it from your hand. And Tamar took the bread and she had, that she had prepared and brought it to 
her brother Amnon in his bedroom. But when she took it to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, Come to bed with me, my sister. No, my brother, she said to him, don't force such a thing. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. As for me, where can I carry my shame? And as for you, you would be as one of the outrageous fools in Israel. Now, therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. But he refused to listen to her. And since he was stronger than her, he raped her. Then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. Amnon said to her, get up and get out. No, she said to him, sending me away would be a greater wrong than what you have already done to me. But he refused to listen to her. He called his personal servant and said, get this woman out of my sight and bolt the door after her. So the servant put her out and bolted the door after her. She was wearing an ornate robe, for this was the kind of garment the virgin daughters of the king wore. Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the ornate robe she was wearing. She put her hands on her head and went away, weeping aloud as she went. Her brother Absalom said to her, Has Amnon, your brother, been with you? Be quiet now, my sister. He is your brother. Don't take this this thing to heart. And Tamar lived in her brother Absalom's house, a desolate woman. When King David heard all this, he was furious. But Absalom spoke to Amnon neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Amnon because he had violated his sister Tamar. So there is the story. And it's quite a shocking story, isn't it? In many different ways. Let me just pray. Let's pray. Lord, there are difficult things in Scripture to handle. Sometimes there are things that are theologically difficult. Sometimes there are things that just confuse us and we don't quite understand. What does it mean by that? Lord, sometimes there are difficult things in Scripture because it's, it's based in an old covenant that we've never been part of and there are, there are things to do and, and rituals and things to happen. But here, Lord, it's a difficult passage because of the subject matter. And yet, Lord, so sadly, this subject is very much part of our society, very much part of our world as well as the ancient world. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray you'd help us to understand what's happening here and just to begin to see hope uh, in a terrible situation. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you would use my words to bring hope uh, and a future for anybody who's been affected by anything remotely like this. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. (coughs) Okay, so the bigger picture. (laughs) And, you know... I ask the question, why is this story even in the Bible? What's it even doing there? Because it could be left out. And if it was left out, it would just make an easier read, wouldn't it? We would go through the Bible and it would be so much easier if this wasn't there. And yet, God wants it included. It's a historical event, a shocking historical event. God wanted it recorded. God wanted us to read about it. He wants us to consider it. And so that's what we're going to do today. And one of the reasons it's here, I think it's here because we should be considering these things, but another reason that it's here is it partly shows the consequence of David's sin, King David's sin. You see, Amnon is David's firstborn son. But sadly, he only displays bad aspects of David's character. He doesn't display anything good about his dad, only the bad things. And so what we saw a few weeks ago was David's rape of Bathsheba. And that is now being repeated in the life of David's son, Amnon, where he is now involved in such an act. I don't know, maybe Amnon thinks, well, if my father David can use his power as king to get what he wants, why can't I use my power as the future king to get what I want? Power can really <clears throat> corrupt and distort <clears throat> and be used like anything in this world. Things can be used for good or bad. Have you noticed that? But almost everything is like, you can use it that way, that's a really good thing that you can do. Use it that way, you abuse it, and it's a horrible thing. And here, uh, power is being used in a horrible way. You see, sin is never in isolation. 
you know, maybe, I mean, Amnon's not thinking this way at all, but if he had been thinking, maybe he'd think, well, it's just me and this, this, this sister of mine, this half-sister of mine. It doesn't really affect anybody else. That's just not true. Um, there are always ripples about sin. Even sin that, you don't, that we're not even aware of. We can be rippled and affected by sin. Somebody else's sin that we didn't even know happened. But they have consequences and it affects us. Um, David's rate of Bathsheba now leads to Amnon's rate of Tamar. But in turn, this will lead to Absalom killing Amnon, which Mark Jones will tell us about next week. So I'm not going to go too much into that. I don't want to steal all his thunder. But, you know, perhaps Absalom saw no justice coming from David regarding uh, Tamar. Because Absalom, when you read the verses, is quite upset about this. He's really angry about this. He doesn't know what to do with his emotions. In fact, this whole story, nobody knows what to do with their emotions, to be honest. The guys don't know as well as, the, as, as poor Tamar. He doesn't know what to do. But he thinks there's no justice coming from David here. Where is a just king? And so I think um, uh, that uh, Amnon decides maybe I can set myself up as a better just ruler than my father. I think that because of 2 Samuel 15 verse 6 says, Absalom behaved in this way towards all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice. So there's people coming to the king and asking for justice, but Absalom is intervening. And so he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. People are going to David for justice, but they don't feel they're getting it. Absalom is the one who says, I'll give you justice. I'll be a just king. I think it's because of Tamar and what happened. And he's, Absalom has been scarred by this. Now, Absalom's uprising is going to lead to the death of 20,000 men. It's a line that you can trace back to the rape of Bathsheba. And this is why I'm saying sin affects people even generations later. And here, what was a king standing on a rooftop seeing a woman bathing, it's going to lead to the death of 20,000 people, as well as all the other things that have already been mentioned and other stuff going on. Sin affects. It ripples out. And that's the big picture. And I just wanted you to see that and understand that. When you read the commentaries, they seem to be obsessed with the big picture. Um, but I want to dip in now. Because the thing is that Scripture cries out for us to pause with this story, I think. We can't rush over this story. We've got to look at the human tragedy that is unfolding. You know, in Scripture, we can easily overlook it. We can easily rush through. Well, we want to know what's going on. We want to look at the fighting. We want to see the kings. We want to see, you know, <clears throat> the line of succession. What about this poor woman called Tamar? We're going to have a look at her. I don't think I'm going to do her justice. I reckon, once, once you start looking at these things, I reckon we could have done a series of three or four sermons on this, honestly. <clears throat> There's so much when you begin to think about it. Um, so, but... We want to look at Tamar because so many women and some men have gone through the same horrible ordeal. That's why we've got to look at it. Do you know what the latest statistics suggest? That 193 rapes take place every day in the UK. That's shocking. One in four women will have been raped or sexually assaulted as an adult. And one in 20 men. These are shocking figures. This is very much a part of our society. This is very much part of our culture. That, you know, these verses from um, a long time ago, I'm trying to think, I actually don't know how long ago, I haven't worked it out, uh, a few thousand years ago, they are so relevant today, aren't they? It's such a relevant story. So we cannot just pass over uh, this terrible story. Um, I was past this book, and it's a really good book. I haven't read the whole of it, but I want to recommend it. It's, I've read some of it, and, and some of what I'm going to say comes out of this. It's, the book is titled, Rid Me of My Disgrace. But um, Rid Me of My Dis is and blocked out in red, and then it's got grace in bold. And um, it's, it's a crossways book, um, and it's written by 
Justin and Lindsay Molcoom, I think. Sorry, I've got my glasses on, right, it's so small. Um, <clears throat> you come to me afterwards and, and you can take a photo of it. I can't lend this to you because it's not my book. But if you're interested, <clears throat> come and take a photo and then look it up. It's a really good book, uh, forward by Mark Driscoll. And <clears throat> it's, um, it's important for anybody that feels like they want to uh, help people who are victims of sexual abuse. That book, uh, as a, from a Christian perspective, obviously it's from a Christian perspective, that book will help you if you are going to be ministering. But also, if you are a, 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 an unfortunate victim of any sexual abuse, that book will help you. It will help you find Jesus and help you know what to do with all of the horrible stuff that's come upon you. So I just want to commend that book to you. So let's look at Tamar's trauma. <clears throat> and the first thing to say is that Tamar was not to blame in any way. She's completely innocent here. She did nothing wrong. And she did not deserve to be treated like this. There is nothing in her actions or anything that deserved any of this or would deserve it. You know, she should expect protection from her older brother, not suffer this terrible assault. You know, older brothers, fathers, there, there, there should be protection. You know, there should be a male in our culture. There should be the, godly, the godliness is a male type of protection over vulnerable. And yet, here, it's taken away. And it's horrible what happens. Um, you know, victims of sexual violence, they're innocent. It's important that we say that. It is never their fault. They do not deserve it in any way. And yet often they can end up blaming themselves because their self-esteem has been destroyed. <clears throat> they begin to feel worthless as a person. And so... They think of reasons and, and, and they can easily turn it inward on themselves. <clears throat> Actually, when you look at the verses, I think Tamar is a strong woman. Because she's the only person who stands up to Amnon and says no. You look at everybody else, nobody else is saying no to him. But she says no. She's a strong woman. And, Ar and Amnon is a spoiled, arrogant fool. Um, who needed confronting in life before this moment. The trouble is nobody had been saying no to this guy. So he thinks he can get his own way and manipulate and connive or whatever it is. <clears throat> That's something David should have done. David clearly didn't do it. <clears throat> and so, um, but the description of this assault, it gives us an insight into how uh, victims feel after such a terrible ordeal. So there is a sense of disgrace, a sense of shame. There's a sense of isolation. You know, Tamar is left feeling worthless and rejected. She's left feeling unwanted and repulsive. And the description of her outward appearance shows us her inward feelings. And verse 19 it says, Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the ornate robe she was wearing. She put her hands on her head and went away, weeping aloud as she went. And so ashes on her head, they're like a sign of humiliation and disgrace. And then putting her hand on her head, it was a, it's, like, it's just like a gesture of grief. And so together, it's like a double image, intensifying the expression of her deep shame and anguish. And then Tamar's robe. It was a special symbol. It was a beautiful thing. Elevating her social status as a virgin daughter of the king. It was a wonderful robe. doesn't describe what it looked like, but we know it would have been a wonderful robe. But now she tears the robe. As her status and her virginity have been violated and stolen. And it reminds us of Joseph, doesn't it? Joseph whose coat was torn and bloodied 
It's a little echo back into that story. And then Tamar weeps aloud. It's just simply an audible expression of her pain. Now, an important question asked by assault victims is echoed in verse 13, when Tamar asks, as for me, where could I carry my shame? That's the question. That's the question that if, if you've unfortunately been in this terrible situation, that's a question you're going to be asking. Where can I carry my shame? What can I do with it? Where can I leave it? Where can I take it? Who can I give it to? You know, shame is something that we carry around with us. It's something that lives with us. It becomes, can become part of our identity. Daily, you can wake up with a sense of shame. Where can I carry this? And there's nowhere to take it. But with no answer, Tamar had nowhere to take it. Look at the responses in the family. Her brother Absalom's response. He says, be quiet for now, my sister. <clears throat> He's your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. That is a terrible, terrible, terrible response. It belittles what has happened. In fact, it's another way of saying it was your fault. That's what Absalom is saying. It's terrible. He'd rather keep her assault and suffering hidden in silence. It doesn't mean that he doesn't care. <clears throat> it doesn't mean that he's not affected. I think he's deeply affected. I think the whole of the kingdom will be affected, as I've mentioned earlier, and what's going to happen. But he doesn't know what to do with his feelings. And sometimes... I'm not giving him an excuse at all, but sometimes when somebody in your family has been sexually abused, what do you do with your own feelings? Where do you go with your feelings about it? For guys, what do we do with our feelings? We probably bottle them. We probably bury them. We probably ignore them or something. <clears throat> Actually, our feelings are important too. and We do need a way of carrying our feelings in a place where we can take our feelings. But his response is terrible, completely inappropriate. And what he does is he's silencing her. <clears throat> He'd rather silence her. And silencing victims of sexual assault is a cruel thing to do. It's cruel <clears throat> to sort of belittle it, to do anything like Absalom says, to brush it under the carpet, be quiet about it. That's cruel. Because, on, you know, on top of the pain that they're already suffering and they're trying to cope with and suddenly they're not allowed <clears throat> to speak. It was never anything to do with this or in any way like this. But I remember once something happening in my life <clears throat> and I remember church leaders telling me not to talk about it. Be quiet, don't tell people. It's a long time ago now. That was hard. I mean, there's nothing like this. But that was hard to not even be able to share it. How much worse living with it. It's a terrible thing. And Absalom also responded <clears throat> by plotting to kill Amnon. So that's his response as well. His response is to silence her, belittle her, and think, I'm going to kill him. He's trying to deal with his emotions. Because I think he loved his sister. Absalom names... His daughter, as uh, uh, um, Tamar, later, in honour of his sister. So I think he loves her, but he doesn't know what to do. And so he thinks, oh, I'll kill the guy. But revenge by murdering the perpetrator is not only wrong, obviously, but it will not bring any healing for the victim. There is no healing in revenge. It just doesn't work. It leaves you feeling empty and still. There's no, still nowhere to carry your shame. <clears throat> David, what's his response? Tamar's father, he says he was furious. But he actually did nothing. And he ignored the pain. Again, just making things worse. <clears throat> Maybe for David, it was just too painful. Given his own life experience 
too painful to go there, but he owed it to his daughter to reach out and protect her. You know, the wrong response by a victim's family or friends, it just intensifies the pain and it intensifies the anguish. Those who have, you should have supported Tamar and given her a voice did not because they were struggling to cope with their own emotions. So we need to move on to uh, some hope in this situation. So Sue's going to carry on for a little bit. So Tamar's question was, where should I carry my shame? And there is actually good news. The good news is that there is a person that we can go to, which is Jesus. And there is a place where we can carry our shame and hurt, and that is the cross. Um, Martin Luther describes the good news as, God receives none but those who are forsaken, restores health to none but those who are sick, gives sight to none but the blind, and life to none but the dead. He has mercy on none but the wretched and gives grace to none but those who are in disgrace. Jesus came for the broken, not for the well. He came for the broken. So we've been hearing about shame and how it destroys our lives, um, how it can make someone um, feel alienated and isolated. It can make them feel worthless, rejected, unwanted, and broken. And it takes away your voice. But God's grace is the opposite. So there is hope and healing. Grace is love that seeks you out when you have nothing to give. That's Jesus coming down from heaven for us. Grace is being loved when you feel unlovable. It's Jesus dying on the cross because he so loved us. Grace has the power to turn despair into hope. There is power in Jesus' name. There is power for the broken. There is power to transform. And I love this. Grace listens, lifts up, cures, transforms, and heals. Jesus chooses to be with us. He came down. He spent time with people. He spent time with the people who were desperate. And we can speak to him about our hurt and brokenness. So Isaiah 63 tells us that Jesus came to bestow on us a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. So God heals our wounds through the cross, which is where we can take our shame and brokenness. He restores his fallen creation through the redemption of Jesus. And I, I believe, I absolutely believe that he can completely restore the sexually abused and bring freedom. Do you know what? No one in the story came to help Tamar, did they? <clears throat> Her family is just doesn't know what to do. But you know what? There is one who came along later and entered her shame and entered her pain. You see, Jesus was tortured and killed, but not for revenge, but to bear her shame on the cross and to offer her a new robe of righteousness to replace her torn robes of shame. And you know how Tamar felt after the assault in verse 19 where she put ashes on her head, tore the robe and wept aloud. It's frighteningly similar to Jesus' experience leading up to and during his crucifixion. You see, he was betrayed by a close friend. He was abandoned by his other friends. He was mocked and beaten. He was publicly shamed and he was humiliated. He was abandoned by God. 
You know, through the cross, he enters into our human experience. He didn't just experience the joy and the wonder of life and, you know, a little baby growing up in a home, you know, with a nice mummy and daddy, you know, and he learns a bit of woodwork and becomes a carpenter. And Do you know what I mean? Nice bitch, you know, isn't just about the wise men giving all the gifts, you know, and, and, and the shepherd saying, oh, what a lovely child. It's about a cross. It's about shame. It's about humiliation. He entered into every kind of human emotion, every kind of experience, and everything comes into the cross because the cross is the place where he pays for all sin, including the sin of sexual abuse and rape, and murder, and terrible things, and the sin of our lies, and deceit, maybe lesser things, but still sins. He takes it all on the cross. Jesus entered her shame as her substitute. He removed the stain of sins committed against her, and he rose from the dead to bring her healing and hope. The Christian message is good news. It is good news. Um, The gospel applies grace to shame and redeems what is destroyed by sin. If you feel like, I just have shame, you can exchange that for his grace. Sue talked a little bit about the work of grace, what it does. It's his undeserved love towards you. And... um, what you feel has been destroyed by sin in your life, and sometimes things happen and we think, that's been destroyed, that's been taken from me, I've been robbed. Jesus can restore. He can recreate in our lives. And the cross and resurrection prove that God can redeem, heal, and make all things new, because that's exactly what happened uh, with Jesus. And so if Tamar's story is like your story today, through Jesus, God can heal you and make you new. He can carry your shame. You don't need to carry it anymore. Where do you go with your shame? You go to Jesus. You go to the cross. You place it on him and you do an exchange. He takes your shame and all the other rubbish in your life and you receive his perfect nature, his, his righteousness. Okay, shall we stand? We're going to pray, uh, and then we're going to sing one more song. So what I'm not going to do, I'm, yeah, thanks, Ben, if you can come up. Uh, we're not going to ask for a response. I feel this is just too sensitive a subject to ask anybody to come forward and respond. Um, I, it's, you know, that wouldn't be kind either, I don't think. Um, but if you have been affected, if you feel like, if there's been any, anything that has struck a chord and you think, I've got to deal with something in my life, then why don't you come privately, you can uh, come and chat to one of the elders, you can come to one of the elders' wives. Uh, we have a pastoral team and we can um, get them alongside you. And in a, in, in a moment, not now, but during the week or an evening or whenever, we can get them alongside you and they can come and they can help and they can pray. And you can carry your shame and give it to Jesus. Isn't that amazing? So we're just going to pray and then we'll sing one more song. Yes, Lord, I just thank you so much that you came to bring freedom, Lord. I thank you that you take what is broken and you redeem. You turn ashes into beauty. And I just want to pray, Lord, for everyone here, Lord. I just pray that that would be the story of our lives, that you take what is broken and you make it beautiful. You restore and you redeem, Lord. Thank you that you're so loving, you're so caring, you're so kind, you're so gentle, you're such a beautiful beautiful loving God and we just worship you. Amen.